on the previous episode of Colorado Experience. Glovo and Illyria are remarkable in just the amount of toxins that basically became their legacy. Glowville, Illyria, Swansea were towns that emerged around the smelters and they were worker towns. And to this day, it's like that. This area became industrial zoning. And so you started to see more and more industry being placed in one community. And yet you still have housing here. So mixing with industry and residential communities is not always great for the health of the communities. And it's a known fact that people who reside in these type of neighborhoods, your lifespan is decreased by 10 years. And that's really unfortunate that your life has to decrease only because of the zip code that you live in or where you reside. The learning that this was the most polluted zip code in America made me more determined than ever to fight for justice in this community. Okay, cool. Let's pick this. Okay, awesome. Okay, there. I feel very lucky in that I found this community. I only have lived here for three years, but I felt right at home. I knew that this was gonna be my forever community. My name is Anna Varela. We are in my home here in Illyria. I work for the GES Coalition. GES stands for Globeville Illyria Swansea Neighborhoods. And it's so important to remember that while we are lumped together with so many shared experiences with the pollution that we experience, we do have three very separate cultures and histories. Good boy, sit. My home is an 1895 Victorian cottage. This area was developed during the Slavic and Eastern European migration to the area. They were working on the rail in the area and other different industries in Denver. It is still an immigrant community, although now it's Hispanic. Of course, everything in my house is vintage, so we're gonna do this with a vintage percolator. Now, originally I wanted a 1960s home and I came out with a 1959 kitchen um, and I'm really proud of that. I had no idea I was moving into the most polluted zip code in America. The contaminants in the air from that really do a toll on people's mental health and their ability to open windows and just enjoy their outdoor space. We of course are surrounded by the freeways the I-70 freeway is horizontal to us, and then we have I-25. And so we have constant cars, and recently with the expansion of the I-70, if you're ever in just total silence, you can always hear the cars. So you can just hear how loud the industry is around here. I think that that's... Uh... Trains, trucks, all day long, it's noise pollution. We believe that taking on the air pollution through the transportation sector will have huge impacts for the community here. My name is Ian Thomas Tafoya, born and raised here in North Denver, and I'm an environmental justice activist who turned into a career. I really became aware of the environmental injustice in North Denver through my work at the city. I worked for Denver City Council, and I started to hear about the I-70 widening and what that meant for my community. And so I got involved in a fight to push back. In 2015, we were approached by a number of community members and community organizations here in Swansea, Illyria, and Globeville because they were concerned about CDOT's proposal to widen I-70 from about 85 feet to almost 300 feet. They were worried about the effect of increased traffic with the pollution that comes with that. 
I'm Heidi McIntosh. I'm the managing attorney of Earth Justice. Earth Justice is a national nonprofit environmental law firm. We use the power of the law to ensure that everybody has the right to a clean and healthy environment. This neighborhood already has higher than average incidences of all kinds of diseases that are related to pollution exposure. Bottom line is that the people in these communities are entitled to a healthy and clean environment. That's what they deserve, that's what the law requires, and that's what we hope to support them in doing um, as they try to achieve those goals. When we were suing on the highway and you take on the state, it's very expensive. We started to run out of the money. I think we raised $150,000 from the community itself. And I went to Washington, D.C. and I asked Earth Justice National, hey, will you help us take on this case? And since then, I've had a very strong partnership with Earth Justice. They represent us on maybe a dozen different issues. None of this project could have happened if Denver hadn't agreed to give 46th Avenue to CDOT. That was the first line of defense that could have been activated for our community. 46th Street was a boulevard where the community came together to shop and get their hair done and to socialize at restaurants. This was really the core of the community at the time. And so when I-70 was originally constructed in 1964, it obviously had a tremendous disproportionate impact on the communities here. But because we had no representation that actually cared about the experiences in this community, we missed that opportunity pretty early on. And so when we saw this being repeated just 50 years later, we were like, we have to stand up. There were a multitude of places thereafter where the city could have demanded more, required more, that could have stopped the expansion. They also deferred to CDOT's opinion that widening the freeway with all of its impacts was actually going to be better for the community because freeway traffic would be moving more quickly instead of being stuck in traffic jams in the way it had been. Now, I've been in a traffic jam on I-70 right through here, and history tells you that you really can't build your way out of traffic congestion. If you build it, they will come. So the C-70 project to expand the interstate, I know it was billed as a way to kind of mitigate previous impacts by putting some of the highway underneath. But I, th I think a lot of the community activists were upset by the process that that construction entailed. We still always talk about the layer of dust that we had on everything during the expansion. So it's just more and more um, pollutants from construction in the area. We try to stop that. Take it around the city, take it outside the city, let us connect our neighborhood, let us re-engage. What they envisioned for their neighborhood was kind of a return to what it was originally before the interstate went in in 1964. And so one of the visions was to get rid of the freeway entirely and reroute the freeway traffic along I-270 where there are fewer communities, it's mostly industrial. If they couldn't do that, the other vision was to put the interstate in a tunnel that would have avoided the impacts entirely. On I-70, first we filed the Title VI complaint, and Title VI is a part of the Civil Rights Act, and we were saying that there was you know, racially motivated prejudice in the development of this project. We weren't granted that by the federal government. And then we sued over the National Environmental Policy Act, which has to do with projects and like understanding what the impacts are. We went all the way to the court on that. We lost on that. They held that things like this deck were enough to mitigate the impacts to the community, even though it was not what the community itself would have wanted. And then we sued under the Clean Air Act. Arguing that the increased traffic was going to result in exceedances of the air quality standards. The Clean Air Act lawsuit, ultimately we settled. It was a really hard decision. I remember crying about it for like a whole day. 
We won some concessions from the state and from the Federal Highway Administration to upgrade windows in the community, take on issues around noise, money to plant trees, and then to study cumulative impact. The park was kind of arbitrarily thrown in there and you know a lot of people in the neighborhood called it lipstick on a pig. And it was supposedly an amenity for the community to have this park. It serves as the playground for the youth during the day and uh, community space the rest of the time like any other park and you know it rides on top of the highway as I was telling you. When the freeway was expanded it gobbled up Swansea Elementary's existing playground. So they had to move the playground and then they gave the elementary school access to the deck here. We shouldn't have, you know, educational facilities, libraries, rec centers, these places where people go to grow and to learn right next to toxic pollution. Putting a park on top of a highway in the most polluted zip code in America feels a little offensive. My thoughts on the park over the freeway are that is a perfect example of when community isn't really heard. The neighbors wanted green space, not astroturf. The neighbors wanted access to active areas, not a locked gate. What we have here is, you know, a, a nice grassy area. There's a soccer field there, which is closed. It's not available to the public other than through a permit. At either end, you've got freeway exhaust coming out, which is one of the concerns. It's conveniently just feet short, requiring stacks to push the air pollution higher into the air. We have over 400,000 cars that pass, and we're boxed in two highways, major interstates, that service the whole United States. Those cars are producing carbon, and then we got the runoff. When it rains and it comes off those highways, the benzene, they found benzene inside the school where kids breathe. Benzene is the worst product. They use benzene to clean auto engines. So the air quality, you know, it all comes back down to the air quality again. Air pollution is something you don't often see. You can see the Denver brown cloud, but that's a different kind of experience than everyday particulate air pollution. I'm Professor Shelley Miller. I am a faculty member at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm one of the principal investigators of this project, Social Justice and Environmental Quality in Denver. I was really happy to be a participant with the SJEQ AtmoTube study. It was with CU Boulder, and I worked really closely with their researchers to understand the contaminants in my area. So this is the Atmo tube. Mine is well-loved condition. They try to give us the same Atmo tube that we've been using throughout the study. And the goal of the project is to understand the environmental impacts and social impacts and well-being impacts on the North Denver communities that have been significantly impacted by all the construction going on around the C70 project and other development projects in that region. So we have a multi-pronged approach, and that has enabled us to really understand what the community members care about and what they um, need more support around. We also then have a technical team, which is based on computer science approaches, and then an environmental team, which is based on air quality um, science. And the community members get this air pollution monitor that they carry with them every day for a month. And what the air pollution monitor does is measure the air quality that they're experiencing. And what would happen is I would wear this either as a keychain, on my backpack, on my person. And what's awesome about this is it was always monitoring the humidity, the temperature, and also the PM1 levels. Those are typically levels of toxins in the area, whether that's dirt or um, skin cells or just general kind of fuzz in the air. So that was really helpful to have this to kind of gauge and look back on day by day. We have analyzed the data that we have collected and we have actually found some very interesting um, um, results from there. We saw a, essentially a direct correlation between the happiness level of the people and their distance from site of the construction. The poorer the air quality or the noise pollution is, the less happy the people were. So one of the 
the unique aspects of this study was that we decided to provide the citizens with immediate mitigation strategies. We made air cleaners for all the participants. We tested the air cleaners in our labs to make sure they were working, and then we gave them to all the participants who wanted one. And these air cleaners will filter out the particulate matter in their environment and reduce the exposure concentration, and so thereby improving the health of the residents that are using them. I really enjoyed that um, study because it really allowed me to say, what is exactly happening around me in my neighborhood and not having to rely on another air monitor down the street. And so even on the days that I think it's a perfectly clean environment, there's still the freeway, there's still Suncor, there's still a slaughterhouse, there's still all these different uh, chemical polluters in the area. When you have the interstates on two sides of the community, you're getting all the gases from that. And then you get uh, Suncor, which is right there in the middle of this highly populated area which is also releasing a lot of sulfur into the environment, and community activists have, have been fighting that for years. Suncor is one of the biggest point source polluters in Colorado. It is an oil and gas refinery. It not only produces a lot of the gasoline that we use in the state, it also produces other things such as asphalt and um, airplane jet fuel and has really affected the health of the community that lives around it. The refinery has been such an ongoing project in a bad way. It feels like every time we make progress, there's a new loophole or the industry spends money. At first, we were talking about air permits. They're flaring and they're constantly violating the law. That hasn't made a difference with their continued operation. That refinery exceeds its permits, on average, according to recent news reports, every three days. Recently, we've seen PFAS spikes that are about a thousand times higher than the EPA recommendation. And PFAS is, you know, the forever chemicals that once they're in the water, you can't really do anything to mitigate them. They are there forever. And so those are things that we've been working with communities to try to fix. So we came together as a community and we said, what can we do? Let's run legislation of our own to try to improve air quality. And it started with an air toxic act. The first year, nobody would carry the bill. So what did we do? We went and knocked doors. We elected leaders from our community to bring air pollution legislation. And we got a piece of it. We got reverse 911 on Suncor of notifications, which I think has empowered the community to understand, one, how to keep themselves safe, and we're more aware now of what's happening at Suncor. I think this is an extremely important policy tool for communities to be aware of the hazardous substances that they could be potentially exposed to, specifically because many of the pollutants that Suncor emits we know have been tied to things such as cancer, benzene for example. Since then we also passed the Air Toxics Act, the Colorado Air Toxics Act, which will set real health-based limits for toxics. So, these permits that we're talking about, they're just a license to pollute. It's about how much you can pollute. It's not about what's tied to science and what protects health. And so over the coming years, we're gonna be setting health-based limits for uh, dozens and dozens of toxics, which is a really good thing, but it's gonna take time. There needs to be a lot more work done to hold Suncor accountable because air pollution is one of the world's biggest environmental health risks. Air pollution is responsible for 7 million premature deaths around the world. And so I am passionate about coming up with ways to not only reduce pollution, but also tackle the ever-widening disparities in exposure to pollution that we see, not just in the U.S., but in cities around the world. This has always been a polluted neighborhood, from when they had the smelters all the way to now when we have Suncor. You can tell a community hi, you are in an extremely polluted area, but if there isn't recompense, if there isn't a way to make things better, if there isn't a way for you to improve the quality of your life despite your air, you can educate someone to the end of time and it isn't gonna have, it isn't gonna have a chance to change their lifestyle. So for my neighbors, the idea of education is almost redundant. They know, based on their lived experiences and their chronic illnesses, that something isn't right here. They know that there's a deinvestment in these areas because there's no sidewalks, there's no ample lighting. So our entire street, from the very top to the bottom, we only have this one light uh, for lighting in the evenings, and it's really unfortunate because it's so high up there and so old that we barely really get any lighting. 
Um, we also, there's a lot of people that always talk about our sidewalks. As you can see, they're old enough that our grass has grown through everything. It's just really inaccessible to someone that's coming down here with a couple wheels or maybe just in a different capacity situation. And I wanted to show you a little bit of um, my front yard. It's not so much that I'm proud of this, but I wanted to give an example of just the amount of effort that we have to do. So. I got this tree from Denver Digs Trees with um, the parks people, and I had to plant it and water it every single day while it was young, and that is the best that I can do right now, but there's so many of my neighbors that really can't spend that extra time, money, come out in the heat to be able to water their trees. And these neighbors, they're awesome, but they are renters, and so when the landlord was able to install a tree, um, he didn't necessarily come back to make sure that it was water, that it was taken care of. It's really important to understand that when these programs come externally and they don't come back to really see the lasting impact, then we're never really going to have a lasting effort because it really isn't the job of renters to build a tree canopy in a community that they might not stay in. When you're a tenant or a renter and the property's not yours, I think people tend to not have a strong ownership or detached um, to the neighborhood and the property doesn't belong to them. So I think a lot of them in their mindset, why should I care if I have weeds in the back of my yard? Why should I care if there's trash in the alley? And I think that one that has a lot to do with it. And the second thing, I think this is really a prevalent factor, the economic status. And you know, people work two and three jobs just to be able to make, just to be able to pay the rent. I mean, rents down here are two, three thousand dollars. There, these areas that are mostly affected um, negatively in the economic financial sense and the percentage of homeowners is lower in those areas particularly in Globeville than anywhere in Denver. The makeup of our neighborhood is changing a little bit more. I think where before we were 75 percent ownership I believe we're now 75 percent renters. Building camaraderie that's the beauty of opportunities for ownership is you build long-term relationships and we've kind of lost that. But now there's a lot of for lack of better words, gentrification or people being displaced, they can't pay their property taxes. The residential profile has recently changed in the last three to four years. The big uh, problem with that is that if the area is gentrified and they're kicked out of the area that they know, then to go to any other part of Denver, it's unaffordable. I do know that in the area, you know, the medium price is around the 400s versus the Denver area, metro area, which is in the 600s. So you could see a huge difference in home values. I think that it's become incredibly hard to afford to live in Denver, taxes are going up. And so even now, these communities are becoming to be gentrified. So you have people paying top dollar to move where it's toxic air pollution and it's not great. They are worried about food access, that's a big one. They want Suncor to be shut down. They want people to act. At some point, there's this community exhaustion and then there's a belief that it's not gonna really result in anything if they do show up. And we have to work against that. We have to be positive. We have to show the success that we have had, the, the laws that we have been able to pass. I always get asked, well, if you don't like your neighbor, well, you should leave. And I said, well, that's not my goal. My goal here is to make my neighborhood one of the best neighborhoods in the city. I believe that success for my neighborhood looks like being heard the same way any other neighborhood would. We don't have green spaces, we don't have sidewalks, we don't have lighting. So success would have to mean having the same ear, the same attention that other communities do. I hope that people see that we've won real protections. We have passed major legislation around lead and pipes, funding for the work, disclosing what's in fracking, regulating air quality. And so we need more people to be involved because it's not just enough to win it, you have to stay involved to make sure it's implemented. Knowing the history of what these neighbors have had to go through, it's imperative that we swing the pendulum the other way. Otherwise, we will lose this community, the amazing history that comes with it and the people that are here, um, and that's that would just change the makeup of, of Denver forever. We're turning the page after 100 years of oppression from the industries in these communities. But I believe that we can envision what it looks like seven generations from now, and we can have clean skies. 
we can have clean drinking water, people can cross the street safely, and they can have a grocery store in their neighborhood. These are real tangible things we know we can do because we have the solutions. It's about the full remediation. And what I would love is for health disparities to disappear, and I would love for the wealth of this community to increase, and I would love for it to be the nicest community to ride a bike under shady trees. What I hope in 10 years is to be able to come out here and just hear the birds uh, and nothing else, like hear the birds and hear my neighbors and hear the kids playing in the neighborhood. What about people here who never get an opportunity to rest, to sleep, to experience silence? And I think that if we, if we don't learn how to do that, um, we'll never hold polluters accountable and we'll always have these expendable communities or sacrificed communities like mine. I want to stay here and continue fighting for my community and what we deserve because if, if I don't, you know, who else will?